night. Hey, so what's going on? So I want to kind of get more to the point um, of what I was talking about the other day. So I actually had wrote something. Uh, it's kind of nerdy. I have a blog. So it's called. Uh, it's pretty much me studying J.D. Salinger, actually, and my whole central premise of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of how um, J.D. Salinger, interestingly, I'm going to blow this up. So J.D. Salinger, interestingly, was um, he was actually Army counterintelligence, uh, and interestingly, in the research that I was doing on J.D. Salinger. I actually found out, interestingly, I kind of went to this rabbit hole of how he, by proxy, actually connects to the roots of Silicon Valley. Um, so, yeah, the big companies, all that type of stuff, right? So, let me just kind of uh, rephrase a little bit. So, we all know the book, famous book, Catcher in the Rye. Very profound book. Um, you know, uh, it's a powerful book. Um, Holding Claw, Claw, Clawfield, or whatever his name is. Um, but there is a book, right? Because there's a lot of mystery behind J.D. Salinger. A lot of people want to say that Catcher in the Rye was a mind control book or whatnot. And the truth of the matter is, I think that's unfair. I think that that actually is a form of what we can consider like weaponizing conspiracy theory. So it's kind of like when you. People just make conspiracy theory and people just focus on that, but all the real factual stuff that went down is kind of lost, and that's what I'm trying to actually understand. And interestingly, I got a book called uh, J.D. Salinger and the Nazis by uh, Eberhard Olsen, and it was uh, published by the University of Wisconsin Press. Um, so this is like no far-right book or anything like that. Um, very good book. It doesn't speculate a lot. It just kind of, uh, Olsen pretty much went to like the, uh, the military archives. He went to Germany to their archives and pretty much just did like a chronological mapping of, uh, JD Salinger's life. Um, I would assume people who are, who stumble upon this video know who JD Salinger is. Um, you know, pretty much one of the most famous writers in American history. Like I said, Catcher in the Rye, Nine Stories. Uh, was it like Zoe and Fran or whatnot? Um, let me see here. But he was very reclusive. He lived a very reclusive life. And I think that kind of added to the mystique of him being, you know, falling into this sort of conspiracy theory of capturing the ride, being MK Ultra Mind Control, and all this type of stuff, largely because a few people who did violence actually read that book and actually. I think um, reference that book as their inspiration. So honestly, there's always going to be you know people like that out in the world who are looking for a message. They're looking for somebody to attach on to. Um, and unfortunately, I think that that was too much to bear for J.D. Salinger. But you have to understand who he was as a person. And he was a Jewish American man. Um, he always felt more American than he did. A uh, you know let's just say Jewish. You know, he felt more of an attachment to his nationality, even though he was a Jewish American. And that's kind of the case for a lot of people in America. You know, it's like, even though we have differences or whatnot, we're still communicating the same language. We're still watching the same sports, drinking the same beer, eating the same food. So it doesn't really matter. But when J.D. Salinger enlisted in the United States Army to fight in World War II, so he's badass. He, he, he uh, fought in World War II. He was at Normandy. He stormed the beach of Normandy. So just imagine, just imagine all of the um, shell shock, the carnage that he must have gone to, but also he actually went to a concentration camp when the Americans had liberated one of them. So just imagine being a uh, a Jewish a Jewish male, or or any just any person in general, but particularly for him because of his Jewish heritage, in discovering a concentration camp, you know, like that would have had a profound existential nihilistic impact on his life. And honestly, I think that that's that's my theory 
is that this book is pretty much almost kind of like a passive way for him to get out his wartime sort of traumas. But he does it through the trappings of a teenage anti-hero who we all love, Holden Caulfield. Um, and there, you notice a certain thing about Holden when he actually, uh, when, you, when you read this book, what does he always say? People are phonies. Why does he say people are phonies so much? It is my personal belief. Maybe somebody else said it as well. So, But anyway, it's my personal belief that what he meant was the military were phonies. The CIA were phonies. The counterintelligence command in which he served were phonies. Why? Because we know why. Everybody knows Operation Paperclip. And the whole Operation Paperclip angle to J.D. Salinger has been kind of talked about a little bit. Um, but the thing about it though, too, is you kind of start going down that conspiracy kind of rabbit hole. And I think you start losing, uh, followers, you start losing, um, you know, pe people start seeing you as less credible, unfortunately, but unfortunately I kind of see this, my approach to this is kind of like guerrilla history. Like I'm just kind of going into the weeds, like it's like vice, vice style. Just imagine reading this like a vice news article or something. Um, that's how I kind of approach these things because there's a lot of kooky history out there. Um, and the interesting thing is that I strongly do believe that, um, I'm going to put my phone on silent, excuse me, is, uh, he was talking about the military because as a CIC agent, which is counterintelligence, uh, core or command or whatever, um, he knew probably even as a low ranking corporal that all of these German POWs that were um, after the war, after the Americans and the allies won and beat Germany, he knew that some of the people probably in the officer ranks and above were helping Nazis get off the hook. So imagine being shell shocked from Normandy. Imagine being college educated at that time, at least college educated. He had to enlist. He never got, he never became an officer. He went to military prep school and everything. Imagine uh, fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, or at least being privy to the battles of the Battle of the Bulge. So, like, even if you're not in the battle, you're, st you're still witnessing bodies and people and casualties. And then imagine going to a concentration camp, and you're Jewish American. And the interesting thing about this book that sheds light a little bit more into the psychology of um. J.D. Salinger is that J.D. Salinger checked into a mental hospital while in um, Germany, I believe in Nuremberg, and the ho the only hospital that had a psychiatric ward, according to Olsen and his research, was actually ran by a Nazi in hiding. It was actually ran by one of the chief Nazis who actually instigated the euthanasia programs. So J.D. Salinger is a CIC agent, and according to Olsen, all CIC agents had a list. It was the automatic arrest list where essentially they knew the people who they had to go hunt for so they can stand trial at Nuremberg. J.D. Salinger was a part of that unit searching for those Nazis, but he has a mental breakdown after going to a concentration camp, after, after experiencing all the war and shell shock, and checks himself into a mental hospital that's ran by a Nazi. You know what I'm saying? Like, either he didn't know or he knew. And honestly, this is a little more complex, but maybe he had an extreme identity crisis. You know, am I a man of the West or do I owe allegiance to my ethnicity first or whatnot? He always felt more European or more Westernized in a sense. And this is speculation, but let's just say that he did know that this person who was running the psychiatric ward at the Nuremberg hospital was a Nazi in hiding, you know, like maybe he had some weird connection with this guy, not saying that like he was in with the Nazis or something like that, but it was almost kind of like staring a person in the face who represented somebody who tried to destroy you and your people were at the same time, you always felt like those people yourself. So like a just very intense type of psychology type thing going on, potentially. It's in that speculation. 
But the fact of the matter is, I think his name was Dr. Ulrich or Fleck. Um, he, he was a Nazi. And the interesting thing, too, about this book is, um, interesting thing about this is, um, J.D. Salinger actually ended up, um, mar um, excuse me, marrying a German woman, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there was speculation that she could have been a Nazi. So you have a Jewish guy fighting the Nazis. He ends up going to a mental hospital, ran by a Nazi, and soon afterwards ends up marrying a woman who was who was speculated not necessarily by the military, but by let's just say other researchers as being a Nazi. Even though Olson actually disproves that um, she wasn't a Nazi at all, um, at least according to him, but. It paints a picture of, a, you know, like a guy with an extreme identity crisis. And you can't blame the guy. You can't blame the guy at all. I mean, he, he felt American. But ultimately, what I'm going to be kind of going, uh, telling you about is this research that I did. And it's about, um, so that's a photo of J.D. Salinger. And... I can't share my screen, so I just had printed it off um, for my blog or whatnot. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get to the point and read a timeline for you. Um, a timeline of a... First off, it's a timeline that correlates this book, but it's a timeline that also correlates this book, The Beast Reawakens by Martin A. Lee, which is pretty much a study of right-wing politics and whatnot. And kind of how the, the Nazis actually, in many cases, went underground. They were actually biding their time. Um, and they, they actually, many went to Russia and many actually went to the United States, as we know, through what? Operation Paperclip. But that wasn't the only operation. So to get to the point, timeline, J.D. Salinger. So... Right here. This is actually pretty cool, too. So that's actually a photo of, I think he landed at Utah Beach. And that's actually a photo of it right there. So just imagine J.D. Salinger just landing on the beach and like being shot at and stuff like that. And he's probably just thinking, I'm just an intel guy. But you got to land on that beach too, son. So what's interesting is that his unit is actually still in existence to this day. So let's start here. December 1942. I'm going to take a quick drink real quick. Hope everybody's having a good day. Um, hope everybody, you know, I know it's tough times for a lot of people. A lot of people are out of work, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I, times are hard. You know, I hopefully our government gets their act together and you know, and hopefully some of these rich people who are making all these billions can show some love. That's the only thing I can really say, you know, but I wish everybody the best. So, December 1942, Walter Schellenberg, head of the SD, the SS Foreign Intelligence Service, who also happened to be a director of ITT's German subsidiary, came in December 1942 when he dispatched Prince von Hohenlohe, a Prussian aristocrat and businessman, to Bern to see whether a rapprochement with the United States was possible. So, so 1942, Walter Schellenberg, head of the... Um, the SD, which was the SS Foreign Intelligence Service, um, actually links up with a German prince, Prince von Max Hohenlohe. And the Hohenlohe family is very important, who was a Prussian aristocrat who actually went to Switzerland to actually connect with the United States intelligence to see if there was a way out for the Nazis. The Nazis were seeing that the war was losing. They were losing the war. Hitler was losing his mind. And they were trying to figure a way out for themselves to save their skin. And I mentioned the company ITT 
That's very important. Now you can look this up yourself. Look up the company ITT. This company is crazy because ITT is an American firm. They invested in Germany and they won a lawsuit against the United States government for war damages. But ITT was actually building Luftwaffe aircraft. So you start to see some shadowy connections here. A lot of industrialists in the United States for funding the Nazis. Everybody already knows about Henry Ford and stuff like that. But people know about Coca-Cola, IBM, with the Watson family, with the punch cards, all that. But there is a lot more. And ITT is nuts. I want you to look them up for real. Because like they're building, American company building German war, war planes. And they win a lawsuit against the government because our bombers our american bombers bomb their plant next level stuff that's higher up stuff like so that's december 1942 september 12th 1943 Otto scorsini saves mussolini so on september 12th 1942 they swooped upon the mountain stronghold where mussolini was being held they stormed the hotel camp in Perior Torre, where the Duce was incarcerated, and plucked him from captivity. With little time to spare, Mussolini and Scorsini piled into a light reconnaissance plane. The plane used sudden, th a sudden thousand-foot drop off the side of the mountain to gain speed. When it pulled out to dive, the plane barely cleared the trees below. An unshaven Mussolini turned white from the vertigo. With tears streaming down his cheeks, the Duce proclaimed en route to a reunion with the Fuhrer, Hitler, I knew my friend Adolf Hitler would not leave me in a lurch. Lee, page 1718. So Otto Scorsese saved Mussolini in a almost action movie hang glider situation or whatnot. So we got here July 20th, 1944. So Adolf Hitler and his top military advisor had gathered at the Wolf's Lair, the Fuhrer's headquarter in East Prussia, for an early morning afternoon strategy on July 20th, 1944. They were witnessing, they were listening to Lieutenant General Adolf Husinger. Chief of Operations of the Wehrmacht, the German Army, delivered a bleak report about Germany's latest misfortunes on the Eastern Front. Suddenly, a violent explosion hurled everyone onto the floor. Writhing and coughing amid thick smoke and dust, several German officers could hear Field Marshal William Keitel shout, Hut etz der Führer? Where is the Führer? Lee, page 13. August 10th, 1944. On August 10th, 1944, 20 days after the abortive coup attempt, 67 prominent German industrialists, including leaders of Messerschmitt, Krupp, Tyson Krupp, the elevator company, and Volkswagen Group, and other major companies, gathered at the Hotel Maison Rouge in Strasbourg. During the top secret, secret conclave, they made preparations for the economic campaign which would follow the end of the war, according to minutes to the meetings, which were subsequently discovered by none other than the United States Army Counterintelligence Corps, J.D. Salinger's crew. Conference records indicate that the uh, participants had agreed to shift a prodigious amount of Nazi loot to neutral countries. Some uh, Nazi firms would be relicensed outside of Germany in order to dodge reparation claims, the minutes noted, so that after the defeat, a strong new Reich could be built. Lee, page 22. So they're meeting all these industrialists were meeting up at hotel, uh, hotel Maison Rouge in Strasbourg, trying to figure out the plans. How are we going to loot? How are we going to get all our money off seas? How we got to rename our companies, shell companies. And the interesting thing is that people out here keep saying that 
Nazis were socialists and all this type of stuff. No, they were not. They were fascists. Fascist is a third position political ideology, so it's a little more complex to define. Uh, the National Socialists, I believe, only got their name because of like, I think it was um, parliamentary politics because how I think the German parliament system at that time worked was is that they had to win votes among different various parties. So you had like the, almost like the Nationalist Party almost absorb parts of the Socialist Party. But the, I, I think that's how it kind of worked out. But the National Socialists were actually corporatists. Um, they gave all the power to the, the industrial elites. And this is why people like Volkswagen Group, uh, Kohler, um, you know, all these German companies basically were just running the economy, even though it was kind of centralized because the Nazis could give things like price controls and edicts and mandates and stuff like that. But it was pretty much corporations. So anyways, so, so the Nazis are looting. Trying to get, trying to figure out plans. Uh, the head of the SD is sending people to Switzerland to try to, net, to negotiate with the Americans for a clean way out of the war. Adolf Hitler gets assassinated at um, the Wolf Slayer. I've actually seen that as a child when I actually lived in Germany. Uh, we went like on a uh, travel tour or whatnot. Um, so that was pretty. I actually, now that I think about it, my apologies. So when I was a child, I actually went to. Um, let me see here. The Eagle's Nest. So uh, Bir Birch's Gardens in Bavaria. That's where we went. We went to the Black Forest or whatnot. But I just remember on the tour, that's when they were kind of talking about the whole assassination attempt and everything. And we went all the way up to the top where him and Eva Braun and all those iconic photos were just walking around and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah. But... So September 1944... Um, there were several confirmed reports that German submarines were taking both people and plunder capital from Spain to South America. Also, September 1944, when Hungary's dictator, Admiral Miklos Horthy, a Nazi ally, was on the verge of suing for peace with Russia as Axis fortunes plunged, Scorsani led a contingent of special forces into Budapest to kidnap Horthy and replace his government with the more hardline fascist Arrow Cross regime. That regime in turn went to kill or to, port to, or to deport to concentration camps tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews who had managed to survive the war up to that point. Crazy. So September 7th, 1944, so Salinger's boss, so now we're back to J.D. Salinger and his timeline. Uh, September 7th, 1944, Salinger's boss, Captain Oliver Appleton, reported that agents of his, this detachment took over the duties of the 83rd CIC detachment in the city of Luxembourg and that offices were established at Mondorf, Sinningen, and Junglister. So that's um, actually from Alson's book, page 77, paragraph 2. So um, September 16th to the 24th, 1944, the Battle of Luxembourg cost Salinger's 12th Infantry Regiment almost as many casualties as the Battle of Hertgen Forest. The regiment was especially hit hard during the action around the town of Eckernach. The town is located on the Sauer River, 21 miles northeast of Luxembourg City. During the Eckernach battle, which raged from December 16th to the 24th of 1944, the 12th Regiment lost a whole company that, that was taken prisoner by the Germans. But the regiment held the town and prevented the Wehrmacht from advancing towards the city of Luxembourg. The city of Echternach was part of Field Marshal Gerald von Rundstedt's preparation for the Ardennes Offensive, also known as the Battle of the Bulge. That's also in page 76, paragraph 1. So now we're going to go a little more into the future, January 1st, 1945. January 1st, 1945. So, um... Although little work 
Although little work of Salander's CIC detachment in Luxembourg was noteworthy, so he's very humble about his research and stuff like that. He's not trying to blow him out to be some action hero. So was noteworthy. They did make one spectacular arrest when they apprehended a Nazi spy outside the command post of the 8th Regiment. This happened on July 1st, 1945, a week after the Battle of Echternach. The spy's name was Marcel Sibylsen, or perhaps Sibyl Sibylsen, and his instructions were as follows. Subject was to find out especially how many armored units there were in the area, their unit numbers, and and strength in men and weapons, whether or not they were fully motorized, and their locations. Also, the location of any other units observed. So, April 12, 1945, President Roosevelt dies. So, April 24, 1945. So, Kaufering Lager IV, also labeled the Cracking Lager, the camp for the sick of the other ten Kaufering camps, but it was really an extermination camp because the sick prisoners, most of them Jews from Eastern Europe, did not receive any medical attention. Instead, they were left to die from their sicknesses or from starvation. Soldiers from the U.S. Army's 12th Armored Division discovered Kaufering Lager 4 around noon uh, on April 27, 1945. At the time, some of the camp's buildings were still burning, so the Nazis tried to cover it up and burn the concentration camp. One uh, On the previous day, April 26, the last 800 prisoners who were well enough to travel had been loaded onto rail cattle cars to be transported to the main camp at Dachau. The morning of April 27th, just before the SS guards abandoned the camp, they had a tank truck spray gasoline on the roofs Damn. of eight earthen huts to house prisoners who took who were too sick to be evacuated. Then the SS set those houses on fire. So the Nazis know they're losing. They know they're killing all these Jews, you know, the Roma people, uh, you know, just other people too, but mostly all these Jews. And they're trying to cover it up, you know, like just crazy stuff. So April 28th, 1945, Salinger probably went to see the camp. Coffering Lager 4, a concentration extermination camp for the sick, also in page 83. So note, the transcripts of Dachau war crime trials supply the most accurate Coffering death camp. According to those figures, Salinger would have seen the corpses of 86 prisoners who had been burned to death, plus 27 others of people had died from starvation or typhus or had been shot to death. Alson, page 86. Crazy. Man. So, another note. The astonishing thing about Salinger's visit to the Kaufering Lager 4 concentration camp is that it did not result in a change of his non-judgmental attitude towards Nazis or in the change of his negative attitudes towards the war in the U.S. Army. So that's one of the things that Alston kind of explores in this book is J.D. Salinger almost seemed indifferent throughout the entire war and he got that proof from uh, J.D. Salinger's correspondence back to America to his, uh, his uh, childhood friends but also to people like Ernest Hemingway, um, he actually had ran in, he actually had befriended Ernest Hemingway when he was a young aspiring writer, and a lot of the letters that uh, Salinger wrote back were very self-deprecating, you know, uh, talking about the size of his nose and all this type of stuff, and and it makes you think that like I think he was having an extreme identity crisis exacerbated by the uh, the extreme post-traumatic stress syndrome or shell shock in that time of essentially 
First off, he survived the landing, I believe, at Utah Beach in Normandy. He was actually at the liberation of Paris. He was at the Battle of the Ardennes, known as the Battle of the Bulge. So, like, Band of, Band of Brothers level. And then he become, then he's a CIC agent hunting Nazis. But also in this book, which is very enlightening, that uh, Alson gets from uh, military archives, is that... Um, J.D. Salinger had actually survived or, you know, he had witnessed one a very catastrophic um, friendly fire accident. So when they were preparing to land in on the, the northern shore of France for the invasion of Normandy, D-Day, um, the British and the Americans were running an exercise where the British would basically shell the beach so that the it would create space for the Americans to, you know, have their bridgehead, you know, make their land on the beach. And accidentally, the British use live ammunition. So in one of the, uh, you, you can almost call them like sorties. So when one of like uh, the first groups of men went out to sea to practice and they were storming a beach in Britain to simulate France, they were blown up. They were destroyed. And the British admiral who was on that ship didn't know, like he got like the wrong communication or something messed up and he actually committed suicide. So J.D. Salinger was literally just on the beach like, you guys ready to go? Yes, sir. You ready for this? All right. The next thing you know, people you were just playing cards with and drinking with and macking on, you know, British women and stuff like that with dead. They're all gone. And you have to go storm the beach in a week. So this is J.D. Salinger dealing with all this. So, um, so May 13th, 1945. Salinger's May 13th, 1945 letter to Elizabeth Murray shows that his nervous collapse had a more profound effect on his mind than mere despondency that it impaired his judgment and his rationality. May 16th, 1945. On May 16, 1945, now we're back to Otto Scorsini. Otto Scorsini emerged from the woods with a small group of German soldiers and strutted into the command post of the U.S. Army's 13th Infantry Regiment near Salzburg, Austria. So while J.D. Salinger is doing all this stuff, you have to think about it like a, like different characters. J.D. Salinger, Otto Scorsini. We're going to talk about some more people, too. So after J.D. Salinger's having this breakdown, meanwhile, Otto Scorsini, who's doing all his crazy Nazi counterintelligence type stuff, decides to give up and he just surrenders to the United States Army. So June 1945, uh, Henry Kissinger this is very important of the nine of the 970th counterintelligence corps. That's a very important corps here was made commandant of Binsheim, uh, Metro's counterintelligence co uh, corp detachment, um, with responsibility for the denazification of Germany. Okay, so it's going to get even more heavier there. So Henry Kissinger was kind of in on something, more so, in my belief, than anything that J.D. Salinger knew about. There's a reason why Henry Kissinger became Secretary of State, and J.D. Salinger became a reclusive writer, probably afraid to go outside. So, go here. So this is July 1945. A week after the end of the war, um, Salinger suffered a mental collapse, so he finally broke. But it took him two months until, until July 1945 to seek help in a psychiatric ward of a civilian hospital. He mentions his nervous breakdown in a letter he wrote to Ernest, Ernest Hemingway from that hospital. And that's also in page 89, paragraph 1. So, in his letter to Hemingway, Salinger says that his nervous breakdown made him turn to a general hospital in Nuremberg because in 1945, no other hospital in Nuremberg had a psychiatric clinic. 
the hospitals must have been the clinicum nord, then called the allegemenes stat statistisch krakenhaus, the municipal general hospital. So July 1945 as well. Oops. So in July 1945, two months after the end of the war, Dr. Ulrich Fleck, a prominent Nazi, still remained doctor of the psychiatric clinic at Nuremberg Hospital. Dr. Fleck's file in Nuremberg City Archive showed that he had been a Strom Banartz, a stormtrooper doctor of the paramilitary SA from 1933 to 1934 and a member of the Nazi party from 1937 to 1945. This is on uh, Al this is Alson's book, page 91, paragraph 1. So side note, and two of his letters from 1945 shows that he came to see Nazi hunting as a joke. Hmm. He's charged with hunting Nazis. He's having a nervous breakdown. He has the automatic arrest list. He probably knows who Ulrich Fleck is. He's probably having this severe, almost delusional, probably state of mind. Just all the trauma, damage, discovering a concentration camp, uh, trying to reconcile his Jewish identity with his Western heritage and all that. You know, he was going through a lot. He was probably acting a little irrational. But he becomes cynical to Nazi hunting. Why? Because he probably knew that some of his higher ups were helping the Nazis escape, which we... Kind of, I'm alluding to with Otto Scorsini's surrender to the 13th uh, Regiment in uh, Salzburg, Austria. So, what do we got here? What do we got here? What do we got here? Boom. So, July 20th, 1945, Operation Paperclip is initiated, but wasn't officially approved by President Truman until the next year. September 1945. In September 1945, Otto Scorsini was escorted to Nuremberg where the war crime trials were about to begin. September 20th, 1945. The OSS, Office of Strategic Services, is disbanded. Ironically enough, on September 20th, 1945, the same day the Prussian spy Reinhard Gellin arrives in the United States. Reinhard Gellin is another important character that I'm going to talk about here. Um, he was uh, Hitler's spy chief, so he was the head of Hitler's not he was he was the head of the Nazi CIA. He goes to America. He gets invited to America, and like I'm saying, like Henry Kissinger, the nine the nine seventieth. I'm going to bring something up about them here soon. La la la. So, October 18, 1945, J.D. Salinger married the German Sylvia Welter in Poppenheim, Germany, by forging a French passport in order to get around fraternization laws. So the U.S. Army pretty much said that you couldn't like mess around with German women and stuff like that. Nobody listened, of course. Um, and there's speculation that his his wife actually was a Nazi a Nazi nurse, but um, later research kind of revealed that actually she wasn't like she was kind of from like the I think the borderlands of Germany and France. But in order to get her into the United States, he forged her passport so there wouldn't be any questions asked or anything. She was a French casualty of war, even though she was German. So that's just important. So November 1945. By November 1945, when Salinger began his work as special investigator, the chief responsibility of the CIC had become the denazification program. The program was created by the Allied Count Control Council even before Germany and Austria were completely occupied. The purpose of denazification was to remove all Nazi officials from positions of influence and to punish all former members of the Nazi party for having supported an evil regime. The basic assumption behind denazification was that all the Germans and Austrians were Nazis unless they could provide proof to the contrary. So March, 1940, March 5, 1946, 
originally OMGUS, i.e., in other words, the Office of Military Government United States, tried to accomplish the task of denazification through special courts staffed by a divisional civilian affairs detachment of the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army recruited all these civilian lawyers to basically help with the denazification and the trials of Germany. But where were a lot of these civilian lawyers coming from? They were coming, of course, not just from some Joe Smo public attorney. They were coming from the Eastern Establishment. They were coming from Harvard, Yale, Pitt, uh, Penn, uh, Virginia, all these places. So they were already a part of the good old boy network, actually. So they were vetting the people who they knew were going to get let off the hook because they already had that plan before they even showed up in Germany. It was all a part of the plan. So uh, by March 1946, the military government's judge advocate estimated that the number of persons in internment camps was 100,000, but the Denazification Policy Board believed that number to be to be tried might well be a half a million people. So they had to try a half a million people. And when I said in internment camps, I'm not talking about concentration camps. I'm talking about the camps for the German prisoners after we had liberated uh, Germany. So the military governor of the American zone of occupation, the famous General Lucius Clay, reported to Washington that even if the War Department were to send him 10,000 Americans for the purpose, he could not denazify the um, he could not denazify the U.S. zone. So the Office of Military Government United States resolved the dilemma by turning the denazification program over to the Germans. What? For real? Say what? Turned it over to the Germans right after the war. Oh, okay, you know, yeah, you're Nazis, you're bad, okay, stamp, go ahead, or whatever. Actually, you know, there's just too many of you, you know, Hans, come over here, whatever, just Heinrich, whoever, just, you know these people, let them off the hook. And then... So, this happened during a ceremony at Munich City Hall on March 5th, 1946. So, they even held a ceremony saying, here, German, here, you have it back. But the German denazification courts, or Sprutzkammern, immediately developed a reputation for whitewashing former Nazi officials, go figure, this must have made Salinger realize the denazification program was not working. Salinger was already suspicious. He knew it was all in vain. And I think that had a major impact on his writing, particularly why this is why I think that Holden Clawfield in Catcher in the Rye calls all the adults phonies because the adults are standing in place of higher military leadership, CIC, British intelligence, all these people. So April 1946. So American intelligence had its first tentative encounter with Ukrainian emerge groups as early as 1946, marking the beginnings of one of the earliest and most controversial covert action projects of the Cold War. So my two main sources, like I said, were this Olsen book, and then also this uh, Martin A. Lee book, The Beast Reawakens, A Study of the Far Right. But I also went to CIA.gov, to their archives, and there was an article by, go to the, I know I cited it here, by Michael C. Ruffner in 1998. Um, it was Intelligence Studies on Nazis, and what Ruffner actually does is he paints a picture about how arguably stay behind units came to be. And if you don't know what a stay behind unit came is, a stay behind unit was essentially after the Cold War or during the Cold War, the United States figured, well, we have to beat the Russians, we have to be all these communist elements or whatnot. So we need to train domestic terrorists 
to actually fight the Russians if they so happen to invade. But the thing about that was a lot of these domestic terrorists were former Nazis, former fascists. Even if they weren't in the Nazi party of Germany, there was plenty of other fascist parties throughout Europe, such as I think it was like the, the Iron Guard of Romania. You had a, I forgot what it was, like the Three Arrows of a Hungary. Um, you know, you have plenty of Italian fascists. You, you had Vichy France, which was a fascist puppet state um and at whatnot so this is going on so even up to like the 70s 80s a lot of the legacy of what the cia was doing still had a lasting effect and it actually led to actual terrorist attacks within europe which actually killed innocent people so this is from the cia dot uh, gov website and it's by michael c ruffner 1998 if you just google CIA, Ukrainian, nationalist, Michael Ruffner, it'll pop up. PDF, it's free. Um, so, I want to read that again. So, April 1946, American intelligence had its first tentative encounter with Ukrainian MRJ groups as early as 1946, marking the beginnings of one of the earliest and most controversial covert action projects of the Cold War. The Tr Strategic Services Unit the successor of the wartime Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, and IE, which then became the precursor to the Central Intelligence Group, later the Central Intelligence Agency, learned that anti-Soviet Ukrainian resistance movements that countered that continued after the war in Western Europe. Uh, Bolslav A. Holtzman uh, SSU's X2, i.e. counterintelligence representative in Munich, became the primary American contact with Ukrainian leaders in the American zone in Germany. So you have to imagine all this, right? So I think the the war ended like 1943. J.D. Salinger is actually still in um or like 1944, but he's still he's still in um Germany. So he actually even leaves the military and I think even stays on as almost kind of like a, a government counterintelligence agent for the most part. But this is a very important time because a lot of shit is going down. The Russians are hunting for Nazi scientists. The Americans are hunting for Nazi scientists. Uh, the Berlin Wall is about to be erected here soon. Um, spies everywhere. Um, and then also, as we know, as we just read, uh, the United States military brings over all these good old boy lawyers or whatnot. They hand over the denazification program to the Germans. Uh, the, they're being let off the hook. Um, a lot of these former Nazis and police officers and Gestapo guys would actually be just become police officers and intelligence agents uh, in, in the Western German intelligence agency known as the BND. A lot of stuff's going on. The Catholic Church is in on it, helping people escape to South America. And then you also just have Nazis just like, I'm just, they're not going to do anything to me. Which makes you call into question the whole idea of World War II in general. It makes you think that like, maybe some of these higher up leaders kind of thought that they knew that they were going to get off the hook. They knew that some sort of appeasement process was going to happen. But we won't go there too much. Right now, at least. I mean, I probably will. But uh, May 10th, 1946, Jerry and Sylvia Salinger arrive in New York on the War Shipping Administration freighter Ethan Allen. On her immigration form, Sylvia claimed her French citizenship. July 1946, upon returning to Germany in 1946, Reinhard Gellin, who had been at Fort Hunt, Maryland, working for the Intel community, he immediately pulled together the makings of a sophisticated espionage apparatus known as the org, the organization. So this is how, so Reinhard Gellin, like I said, he was the head of Hitler's CIA, basically. He realizes that the Nazis are going to lose the war. So he's like, well, I got all this information about the Soviets because, you know, our enemies were the Soviets. And now that Germany's gone, your enemies are the Soviets. So I have information. I have leverage. So you can hang me at Nuremberg 
or you can just include me into your intelligence apparatus. And there was two camps within the American intelligence agencies. You had the Americans who were like, no, we're not letting no Nazis in here. We just fought a war. What are you doing? But then interestingly, you had another camp who were sympathetic to Nazis. They were anti-Semitic. They had respect for the Nazis or whatnot. And um, Patton, Patton was anti-Semitic. Um, it's just how it was, unfortunately. And Reinhard Gellin was able to, you know, wine and dine his way into creating this sort of intelligence operation on the auspices that he would give information about the Soviets and anything else going on to the Americans. But he was playing the Americans. He was playing us. So, 1947... Gellin's spies would work initially for Army Intelligence and then for the CIA, which was founded in 1947, supported by regular subsidies from U.S. taxpayers and wealthy German industrialists. He set up his base of operations inside a mysterious high-walled compound near Munich that had once housed the staff of Rudolf Hess and Martin Bormann, Hitler's deputies, high-ranking high guys. So, by 1947, there had officially been a change in emphasis, in quotes, change in emphasis, according to one classified CIC report, from the denazification mission to the collective of positive intelligence, which meant anti-communism rather than Nazi hunting, was now the guiding principle of CIC policy. To the extent CIC operatives continued to chase Nazis, it was usually not to capture them, but to recruit them. So Salinger is out of the CIC at this point. But at the same time, I think he kind of knew something was going on. He knew he kind of has probably some suspicion that it's all in vain. Like he probably already felt nihilistic, depressed, angst from his own demons and whatnot. But I think that maybe that was even a prophetic energy because I think he knew that it was all in vain. He was a phony. They were phonies. They were lying. They were recruiting Nazis. He's a Jewish guy. We we fought this war. You know, like, what's up with all the propaganda and nostalgia? That's why J.D. Salinger, throughout this research by Allison, comes off as very pessimistic. And I think that pessimism finds it, its way into the character of Holden Caulfield in Catcher in the Rye. So, 19, so it's also in September 1947, nevertheless, in September 1947, he, i.e. Otto Scorsini, was acquitted of illegal actions during the Battle of the Bulge after a British officer testified that Scorsini had done nothing, that his ally counterparts had not themselves considered or attempted. So, he had a British lawyer probably British intelligence lawyer, who got him off the hook by saying that, oh, well, the Americans did it. But whoa, 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 bro, like, aren't we allies here? And isn't he the enemy? You know, like, it makes you, like I'm saying, what it calls into question some of the stuff about how World War II in general might have even been started. It might have actually been concocted by the East Coast American Wall Street establishment but also the upper nobility of the British royal fam of the British establishment. I'm not gonna say royal family, even though I think Prince Edward was a Nazi. And you also had the Clydeson set um, in uh, Germany with a uh, Lady Astor. Um, so you had a fascist element in Britain. So, so this is crazy. So March 17th, 1948. In early March 1948. Frank Wisner, and I put in quotes, he was a part of the secret society called the Seven Society at the University of Virginia, a former OSS officer and member of the State Department's policy planning staff, proposed that the State Army Navy Air Force Coordination Committee, SANAC, 
form an ad hoc committee to, expo to explore the use of Soviet exiles. So what I'm going to do real quick, I'm just going to run to my bookshelf and I'm just going to grab some real quick. So I'll be right back. Alright, so the last thing I read was about Wisner and the Soviets, right? So let me finish this quote here. So Wisner, very important guy in the CIA. Read about him if you want to. Very fascinating character. So he had he concocted this idea to recruit Russians uh, defectors. Um, some people call them white Russians uh, because they were the Russians who actually they uh, they wanted democracy. They didn't want uh, totalitarian communism. So, of course, the CIA was all about that. But one of those uh, Russian intellectuals who came over was probably Vladimir Novikov. Vladimir Novikov, he came from, I think, almost pretty much like a lower nobility, upper middle class type family. And he ended up teaching at Cornell University. And who was this student at Cornell University? The famous postmodern author, Thomas Pynchon, who wrote Gravity's Rainbow about what? The V2 rocket program. So I think the reason, for example, why they would have recruited a person like Vladimir Novikov, in my personal opinion, I don't have the proof of that, but I would assume he just pops up after World War II, is uh, it was kind of a propaganda campaign. It's kind of like if we can show Russian people in America or whatnot, you know, it's there's a lot of propaganda that can be drawn from people like that. And so he was kind of a powerful sort of force, you know, to kind of show the more freedom loving side of the Russian pathos, I guess. But what type of freedom is Nabokov into because Lolita? I mean come on, I mean what are what are we insinuating here? Lolita, um you know, some crazy, crazy stuff. He he liked his woman young. Talking about some Jeffrey Epstein level stuff. But anyways, so back to the timeline. Wisner propo proposed in Sanak 395 to increase defections among the elites of the Soviet world and to utilize refugees uh, from refugees from the Soviet region and whatnot. So uh, the world, world in the national interest of the U.S., uh, the paper noted the great dissatisfaction of many Russians since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and the growth of Russian anti-communism during the German occupation of World War II. Um, Wisner believed that at least 700,000 Russians were scattered in Europe DP camps, displaced person camps, and elsewhere. Uh, this figure, Wisner claimed, represented the potential nucleus of possible freedom committees, encouraging resistance movements into the Soviet world and providing contacts with an underground. According to Wisner, the United States remained ill-equipped to engage in political and psychological <laughs> conflict with the uh, Soviet Union, and the Soviet satellite areas, areas like the USSR are tending to become terra incognito, American ignorance of the Soviet Union in all fields and at all levels, he lamented, was profound and growing. And this is according to uh, Michael Ruffner's CIA in 1998 publication on Ukrainian nationalists with uh, Frank Wisner. Like I said, stay behind units and stuff like that. So October 1948. As a result of Frank Wisner's Sanak 395, the CIA undertook 
in another study on various emerge groups in Europe. Zolt Ad Adrati and Boleslav Zoltman had moved on to new assignments, so they were CIA, CIA men. And with the CIA's Office of Special Operations in Germany, now had the responsibility of assessing the Ukrainians. Completed this report, known as Project Icon, in October 1948, the report drew from and updated Arati's earlier December 1946 work on Ukrainian nationalism. He based his conclusions on the files of the Army Counterintelligence Corps in Munich in CIA records. So that's why the CIAC was being used. You know, J.D. Salinger was basically gathering all this data thinking he's hunting Nazis. Just just for that data, his his case files, those of his superiors and his co-workers and people in other detachments, to be given over to the OSS, later the SSU, St Strategic Services Unit, and then later the um, CIA. For what? For pretty much vetting people who are going to be in these right-wing nationalist, stay-behind militias on the auspices of fighting <clears throat> the Russians. And like I said, like JD Salinger wasn't necessarily caught up in that directly, but like I said at the beginning of this video, by proxy, he just reveals all of this if you just dig a little deeper into JD Salinger himself. So, 1949, there were plenty of true believers in the CIA, which was given the green light to engage in political actions, propaganda, and paramilitary operations that relied heavily on the services of Reinhard Gellin and his spooky Nazi outfit, as one U.S. agent described it. <clears throat> the org already employed 4,000 Germans when it was bolted, locked, stock, and barrel into the CIA in 1949. So by 1949, the Nazi org of Reinhard Gellin, you can just call it the, the Reinhard, um, the Gellin organization is what people call it. By 1949, they were a part of the CIA. This was during the peak of the Chicken Little era of American espionage, when the sky was always on the verge of falling, so it seemed. The agency began shelling out what amounted to 200 million, some of it siphoned from the Marshall Plan Kitty to satisfy the org's voracious covert appetite. So not only did we let the Nazis off the hook, U.S. American taxpayers were funding this Nazi intel apparatus $200 million in 1949 money. 1949 money. I don't even want to know what that is now. That's crazy. And like I said, where did I begin all this? J.D. Salinger and the Nazis. I think we're starting to see who the real phonies that uh, Holden Clawfield was talking about. So, let me go here real quick. Hey, hey. So, on July 26, 1949, on July 6, 1949, a decree of the Family Court of Queens, New York, annulled Salinger's marriage to Sylvia Welter. 1950, Galen's biggest booster at the CIA was no other than da -da -da, Alan Dulles. Dulles Airport, D.C., who uh, started running off-the-shelf intelligence activities in Eastern Europe from the office of his Wall Street law firm before he formally joined the agency in 1950. So Wall Street law firms, who was doing the denazification program, as we just stated, uh, in that correspondence with uh, General Lucius Clay, all these uh, civilian officers, or all these civilian lawyers that were brought over to help with the uh, uh, AUGMAS, the, uh, the military government of Germany, in uh, occupied Germany after the war. So all of this stuff is connected. 
Wall Street, Dulles, Skull and Bones, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, letting Nazis off the hook. They knew damn, they were probably, they had Nazi sympathies themselves. And people want to say that systemic injustice doesn't exist in America. Hmm? You know what I'm saying? Like, is that even a fair fight if you're not <laughs> of that persuasion? But, uh, we go here. So, Alan Dulles was Gellin's biggest supporter. Crazy. So, July 1st, 1951, Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger is published. And I think that J.D. Salinger was trying to tell us something, but he couldn't come out and say it, probably. I mean, think about it. He was a former military CIC guy. He couldn't just come out and just say, we're recruiting Nazis or whatnot. He probably had to hold, hold that in his whole life. Hold that in his whole life after being a Jewish man and witnessing a concentration camp, and storming the beach of Normandy, putting his life on the line for a country that just betrayed him. Betrayed everybody, really. For what? Useless intelligence, which was later proved in the 1990s when they revealed all of this stuff. Millions of dollars, $200 million in 1950 money. I mean, it's crazy. So, so Catcher in the Rise published July 1st, 1951. Uh, August 23rd, 1951, Frank Wisner becomes deputy director of plans of the CIA and is reported to have been instrumental in the Iran Revolution and Guatemala, Banana Republics, all that. And Frank Wisner is nuts, too, because Frank Wisner later committed suicide. Um, he had a mental breakdown prior from doing all this stuff. I think he had, like, electric shock therapy, which was very common at that time. Um, he later committed suicide, but he was friends with, I think his name was Kim Philby of the British intelligence and Mr. Philby actually ended up being a Soviet spy. He was a, he was a double spy. He was working for British intelligence, a part of a group called the Cambridge five who were busted and he defected to the Soviet union. And if you look up, you look him up on Wikipedia, uh, I think it's named Kim Philby or just look up the Cambridge five. And you'll see his face on a stamp of the Soviet Union. They call they consider him a hero. So think about this. This is what I'm saying when it comes to a lot of the stuff that went down before World War uh, One and Two. This is a book, for example, that kind of illuminates a little bit of the uncomfortable talk that you don't really talk here about in history. And if you haven't seen my other videos, this book is by Brian Mark Rigg. And this is not some far right conspiracy theory book. This was written by, um, he went to Yale University, Cambridge. He is a professor at the American Military University. He also served in the Israeli Army. And he is also, he was also an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. He won the 2003 Colby Award winner for history. This is a serious book right here. And just, just Hitler's Jewish soldiers, just try to wrap your mind around that. And like I said in other videos, is that um, it is my personal belief that the upper echelon of the orthodox radical community knew that the Holocaust was going to happen, and they probably wanted it to happen. And that's very controversial. I'm not anti-Semitic at all. I think Israel has a right to exist, even though I don't think it's a perfect state at all, because there's people called Palestinians that also live there. Uh, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm just saying, like, I didn't write this book. And this book is not some fringe conspiracy book. It was even ho it was even mentioned on Dateline on NBC. It was also talked about in the Los Angeles Times in the 1990s, I think, when it came out. So this is what I'm saying. So Frank Wisner, Kim Philby, Cambridge Five, Soviet spies, but they're all from Cambridge, Oxford. Well, where does MI5 and MI6 get all their intelligence people from? From the top universities. They're all these sort of, you know, social club, 
you know, Cheerio for Queen and Country, Oxford Cambridge people. And uh, it paints a picture, though, too, you know, that arguably, like I said in a previous video, if Kim Philby was a Russian double spy, where was Ingalls from? He was from England. Everybody talks about Marxism and Karl Marx or whatnot. You know, a lot of people haven't even read the Communist Manifesto and they got something to say on it. But Ingalls was the one who helped Marx. And I think they were a part of the new Hegelian club or whatnot. So this is why I think like Marx talks about like um, dialectics a lot, like uh, material dialectics and, and all that class class struggle, basically. And, you know, they kind of critiqued Hegel's sort of perfect view of reality and whatnot and that. You know, history is kind of a constant flux of evolution and, and, you know, change towards this sort of like utopian state is kind of like the, the basic, let's just say simpleton, uh, summation of, uh, Marx and Engels, but Engels was from England, you know, so Marxism was actually created in England and actually in exported out there to all these other countries. Why? Because probably because of what happened in World War One. Like I'm saying is that you had, I said this in other videos, and I'm going to get back to the timeline here, is that World War I was honestly, you could call it the war of the democratic experiments, where you had the liberal democracy, fascism, and communism. Interestingly, you had, so those three systems, right? But then we have, we have three countries, right? So England represents the liberal democracy, but also the United States, right? Where does fascism pop up? It pops up in Germany, right? And where does communism pop up? Pops up. It pops up in Russia, right? But in World War One, these were all monarchies, and all those monarchs were related. King George, Tsar Nicholas, and uh, Kaiser Wilhelm were all related via Queen Victoria. So basically, King George hypothetically snuffed out his cousins. You know, like he got the Germans out the way. He took out the Catholic Holy Roman Empire, basically, which was already kind of crumbling, particularly with, uh, you know, the Germans breaking off from the Austrians, the Habsburg dynasty. This is where you get the kind of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is pretty much kind of in decline, really, because the Habsburgs were the Holy Roman emperors for hundreds of years. They monopolized the Holy Roman uh, seat. But the Germans who were arguably the original Holy Roman emperor, emperor, emperors, eventually by the time of Bismarck and uh, the uh, Ho Hohenzollern dynasty uh, of, of Prussia, uh, that's why you know Prussian is such a German thing, the Hohenzollern dynasty and Bismarck basically got independence from the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, i.e. the Holy Roman Empire, and they became Germany. So this is where Germany comes from. Um, in the modern sense of it. So he got rid of that. The King George got rid of that. And then also he had to get rid of his other cousin, uh, Tsar Nicholas. And how did they do that? Fund the Bolsheviks. Because a lot of the Bolsheviks, it's reported, got their funding from Wall Street. And you would say, why, why would they do that? It's called regime change. It just makes sense. It, it's like, it's Game of Thrones. It's a chess match. It's like, England, had, they're very clever. They're a clever little island nation. They ran the world for a reason. Why? Because of brutality, intelligence, administration, understanding their cultures, uh, the people who they ruled over, but really became because of administration. And uh, by funding the Bolsheviks, basically, they were able to basically just get rid of the czar. And interestingly, Russia became our ally in World War II when we snuffed out Germany once and for all. And I'm not saying this is like a good thing as like, oh, Germany. I, I used to live in Germany. I like German people and whatnot. Um, but what, that's what I'm saying. It's like this is some next level, higher planning, the stuff that really runs the world type stuff. And it's kind of hard to put in context because we're so used to watching movies, you know, history books and all this type of stuff. But it doesn't really put it into context unless you start looping everything together. Um, but I, so I started that whole little tangent from, uh, Kim, Kim Philby, British Soviet spy who had attachments to, uh, 
Frank Wisner. Frank Wisner actually had ties to Kermit Roosevelt Jr. I think the grandson, I believe, of Teddy Roosevelt. And Kermit Roosevelt's important. Why? Because he helped lead the coup in Iran in the 1950s. He helped put the Shah into power, which helped with uh, Persian oil, right? And Persian oil, all that type of stuff was what? British BP, British Petroleum. Um, Standard Oil, the Rockefellers. And then right across the Gulf, who do you have? You have Getty Oil with John Paul Getty and his dynasty. And you start to see the sods rise up. So right after World War II, you start to notice that there's a rat race for Arabia and the oil there. Why? Because arguably, is my personal opinion, is that the Cold War was actually kind of, you know, other people believe this too. I think even like, you know, Jay Dyer's even said this or whatnot. But at the same time, I'm not really trying to, I don't like some of his stuff, but he's a, he's a cool guy or whatever. But this is my opinion, is that it was, or a lot of people's opinion, it was all about controlling energy prices. How do, you, how do you control people? You control the energy source. You know, you cut the world in half between dialectics that are created from the West, I mind you. Capitalism from Scotland, Adam Smith, even though technically you can go through Italy and Belgium and Bruges and all that. Um, and then you also have communism coming from Germany and England being exported from Europe to the developing world, because Russia at that time was a developing country. It was it was nothing but peasants and serfs who were liberated. They were the Bolshevik. They were the people who said screw the royal family. And then you had China and all this type of stuff. So it looks on the surface from a paper because of all the propaganda of rah, 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 America, we're going to be communism, this or that. But really, it came from the West. I mean, it's 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 hard to wrap your your mind around like how could why why are we fighting wars then? A lot of different reasons. It's like we prop them up on this ideology that we gave them in order to achieve probably a lot of different goals of like population control. Why why was communism always in the most populated countries like China and India? Um, also, to a certain extent, uh letting the different communist countries vie for control with themselves. Like for example, China and Russia never linked up in the Cold War. Why? Because they were competing against themselves too and everything or whatnot. We the United States was friendly with ch communist China during the Cold War than we were with Russia. And isn't it interesting now how we flip that even though technically Mao Zedong was a uh, he worked at pretty much like a Yale YMCA, uh, and that, I'll I'll go there later on there. So let's get back to this. So Catcher in the Rye was published in 1951. Frank Wisner later becomes the uh, director of plans for the CIA. 1954. This is where the Silicon Valley ties comes into play. Um, Otto von Bolschwing arrives in the USA. So who is Mr. Otto von Bolschwing? Let's see if I have a photo of him. And I do. That's Otto von Bolschwing. Nazi. SS. And you see right below. SS. CIA. Right there. Where does he die at? Carmichael, California. Where is Carmichael, California close to? San Francisco, Silicon Valley. And this is where the Silicon Valley tech ties are going to come through. And like I said, guys, where do we all begin at? We began with J.D. Salinger and the CIC connections. So 1962. Heinz Krug, a Nazi scientist who went to work for the Egyptians to help them develop rockets, goes missing and was likely kidnapped by a team led by Otto Scorsini. Remember, he turned himself in uh, when J.D. Salinger was actually just leaving uh, Europe, I believe, with his uh, German 
French wife. Um, after Krug was shot, three Israelis poured acid on the body, waited a while, <laughs> waited a while, and then buried what was left in a hole they had dug beforehand. Gangster, wrath of God. Don't mess with the Holy Land. They covered the makeshift grave with lime so that search dogs and wild animals would never pick up the scent of human remains. Dang. During the war that ended 17 years earlier, Krug was a part of a team of superstars at Pinemunda, the military test range on the Baltic Sea where top German scientists toiled in service to Hitler and the Third Reich. The team was led by no other than Werner von Braun. Was, was proud to have engineered the rockets for the Blitz that nearly defeated England. England. Ooh. I'm going to be right back because I'm going to go grab another book. Two books. Three books. All right, so right, we're over here talking about. Whew, I don't know about you, man, but I love this nerdy ass history stuff, man. But so we're talking about. So I just mentioned Werner von Braun, who wrote about the V two rockets. Thomas Pynchon, famous postmodern author. Uh. That's a whole analysis in itself, but um, remember I said too, but also, who was Thomas Pynchon, a student of Novikov? What, who was Novikov? He was a rich elite Russian guy, and who was trying to recruit these Russian people? Frank Wisner, CIA. You start to see all these kind of connections and webs start to kind of like come up. And, inter and I, I, I can honestly loop in white noise. My analysis, you probably haven't seen it, but my earlier videos a little bit though too. But I'll kind of wait for that. But um, so, so Otto Scorsini kills uh, Heinz Krug, a Nazi scientist working for the Egyptians to build nuclear weapons because Mossad had hired Scorsini on the auspices that they would release him from Simon Wiesenthal's Nazi list if he helped assassinate his former Nazis. And Scorsani was like, sure. And But honestly, Scorsani stayed a Nazi his whole life. He, was, he said he just loved the action. And if you look at a photo of Scorsani, you'll, you'll notice why. He has the whole battle scar, the, the uh, dueling scar and all that. So November... 27th, 1962, a parcel sent to rocket scientist Wolfgang Pills exploded in his office when opened on 27 November 1962, injuring his secretary, Otto Scorsani likely behind it after being recruited by Mossad in order to not be outed as a Nazi. So Scorsani, man, man mailing bombs and like Israelis over here. Is, Burying people so dogs can't find them, like some hardcore stuff, man. So, October 29th, 1965, Frank Wisner kills himself. Like I already kind of said all that type of stuff, so I won't really go back into it. Now, some Silicon Valley stuff starts to come. Honestly, I don't know whether I should make this a part two or what, because it's about to get freaky. It's about to get freaky. Actually, I'm going to do a part two. So, stand by, everybody. Be right back. <laughs> 